keep everyone awake after lunch. I know it can be hard sometimes. Um, I think for me it's quite exciting not to have to give the preliminary what is crowdsourcing, what kinds of tasks, what kinds of motivations, um, because hopefully you've heard a lot of that and you might know a lot of that already. There's a lot of expertise in this room. Um, my background is in museums, but I'm now working on a PhD in digital humanities in a department of history, um, and I'm a computer scientist by training. So I kind of tend to jump between museums, libraries and archives, into academia, across to citizen science and all kinds of fields. Um, like Stuart, I often use the acronym GLAMS um, for galleries, libraries, archives and museums, and also because it just sounds cooler than MLA. Um, so after a day full of talks on crowdsourcing, things might start to blur into one. You've heard a lot already. So my point is quite simple. Um, I think crowdsourcing can provide a platform for audiences to enjoy deep and meaningful engagement with heritage and humanities work. Yes, crowdsourcing is productive. Yes, it's a form of participation, but it's that combination of meaningful work and deep engagement that I think makes it really special. So we all know that crowdsourcing is productive. Um, and there's a growing number of projects in academia and GLAMs that show that people are really interested in this field. Um, this screenshot is last night, um, the stats from Trove. Trove is one of the first crowdsourcing projects in the humanities um, from the National Library of Australia, looking at their digitised newspaper collection. It asked members of the public to help correct the errors that were created during the process of digitising text from the print newspapers. Um, so far, they've corrected about 90 million lines of the newspapers. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that tags are a combination of terms that people think might be useful for others um, if they're following particular topics through the newspapers, but it can also be personal tags. So I could look for my family history um, in this and tag things with like possibly dad's dad or something. Um, so it kind of encapsulates the dual motivations that people have in these projects. They're helping others and sometimes they're helping themselves. But I think crowdsourcing also meets some of the core missions of GLAMs and academia, whether it's engagement, impact, increasing public understanding and appreciation. Um, this slide comes from Nick Poole's work collecting the mission statements of various museums. Um, and in the top ten words are things like people, public, collections, understanding, learning, access and enjoyment. These things are really important to museums, or at least that's what they put in their mission statements. Um, university mission statements are often similar. I tried to find one for Oxford, but they don't seem to have one. Um, so I picked one from Harvard, which talks about aiming for the advancement and education of youth in all manner of good literature, arts and sciences. Um, so there's a common concern with learning, with engagement, with understanding the world around us. And I think that even if you're cynical and you don't really care about people out there, um, and I've worked in the combination of academia and glams long enough to know that some people don't, um, understanding what audiences get out of participation in projects helps us design better and more productive projects. Personally, I think you should care, but okay, I can't tell you to. Some of this almost turned into a rant against user-generated content, um, and I think this is more than 10 years of cynical working in museums coming out. Um, they're like newspapers. Glams really love user-generated content. They pop have your say boxes on everything that's not nailed down. User-generated content is similar to crowdsourcing. It's a form of public participation. It raises similar issues of validation, data ingestion, of integration with internal records management systems. They both raise issues about authority, trust, expertise. They're a point that sort of encapsulates the changing relationship between cultural humanities organisations and their audiences. But it's often difficult in user-generated content to find projects that produce content with the same value for the reader as it has for the participant at the point of leaving the comment. Um, I spent two and a half years moderating comments at the Science Museum. I think I saw about 8,000 comments that said, I like the robot. <laughs> That's great, I'm really glad you like the robot. But I'm not sure that I got a lot out of knowing that someone else liked the robot. Um, even when there's insightful comments buried in that noise, that, that signal is often lost. Um, but I think it's something even worse than that. Is organisations ask for feedback and then they turn their back. They don't listen. It doesn't change anything in the organisation. Why are we asking members of the public to spend their time telling us what they think if we don't care? Um, so I think one point of contention is always asking whether a comment from a member of the public, and I don't mean a complaint, 
um, but whether a comment from a member of the public can change anything in an organisation. Um, often user-generated content isn't even kept. Um, so I think sometimes user-generated content as outreach can be a little bit of a cynical exercise um, and it's often not regarded as real content or real work. So my vision is being part of something bigger than yourself. Um, we can do better. A lot of the motivations for participation in crowdsourcing, citizen science projects like Galaxy Zoo, hobbies, traditional volunteering, they boil down to a sense of being engaged in meaningful work, being part of a community and contributing to something bigger than yourself. So it's kind of obligatory if you work in crowdsourcing to come up with your own definition. Um, I don't expect anyone else to use a def my definition, it's just my way of understanding where the boundaries lie in an area like crowdsourcing, which is particularly kind of buzzwordy, subject to change. Um, it'll be different next month, I think, as a field. But one of the key things about crowdsourcing projects is that participation is directed towards the specific, shared, substantial goals of the project. If we compare the cynicism of the worst user-generated content projects with the Citizen Science Alliance's belief that all projects must answer a real scientific question the projects must never waste clicks or the time of volunteers, that volunteers should be respected as collaborators. 40 years ago, the phrase, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, was coined, but I think it's still true today. So engagement is important in this definition because it suggests the importance of public, the public benefiting as much as the organisation does, um, if not more from that participation. And I think picking up on Stuart's point, a, a shared significant goal or question is what lifts it out of being a kind of a cynical exercise into something that can fulfil altruistic motivations and fulfil that desire to be part of something larger than oneself. Okay, so this is one of the challenges that I set myself. Um, in my first crowdsourcing project, which I started about 2009, I think, um, I was working at the Science Museum and doing a Masters in Human-Computer Interaction. Years of working in various museums meant that I knew how extensive the backlog, backlog of undigitised, undercatalogued, undercontextualised under material was. I was aware of projects like Steve.Museum that worked with art objects, and I wanted to see if we could get crowdsourcing to work with difficult objects to make them interesting enough for people to create content about them. Um, one of the things about working in a museum is you get to see people react to conferences, uh, to objects, and people can walk through a gallery in about eight seconds. So if I could get people to look at a single object for eight seconds, then I've already done well. <coughs> um, these objects are actually from a different museum of design and technology, but they're indicative of the kinds of content that I wanted people to be able to appreciate. Apparently these are toys. I'm not sure what kid asked for them or what parent thinks they're suitable toys, but it gives you an idea of what kinds of difficult objects. Um, so compared to the objects in art museums and art galleries, um, which tend to have smaller collections, I think it's 2,000 um, paintings in the National Gallery compared to 200, a quarter of a million objects of the Science Museum group. Um, so artworks are easily tagged in terms of styles, colours, materials, content, um, as we've heard. They can even evoke emotional, even visceral responses. Social history object collections, technical collections, um, contain a lot of spark plugs, a lot of widgets. <laughs> Um, a lot of really boring, repetitive objects. They can be technical, they can be reference collections of clay pipes. Um, I worked with one that was 800 broken oil lamps, Roman oil lamps. Um, the object can be difficult to interpret. Its meaning might be obscure, its purpose might be complicated. Um, so I turned to casual games as the ideal platform to overcome barriers to participation in a kind of difficult, authoritative museum space um, and to provide a framework for encouraging people to look at objects. Um, and I should point out that it's not gamification because I find that a highly problematic term. Um, and I'll debate that with you afterwards if you like. So these are screenshots of the games that I made, including some of the more modern technical objects. Um, as astronomy moved from being about brown sticks into things that look like ice cube trays or random solar arrays, they got even more difficult to interpret. Um, so one of the key findings was this, the importance of the magic circle. It's an invitation to step into the world of play, to step into the world of the game where different rules apply just in that space. So in this game, the player meets someone called a junior creator called Dora. It's her first day. She's accidentally deleted all the data in the thing and she needs your help to fix things up. 
Um, one of the things about introducing a character is that it's really powerful. I had people in my um, <coughs> test interviews. One person told Dora off for deleting the data. It's like, she's not real. <laughs> she's just a character. But it shows the power of a character and the, the power of a minimal narrative. Um, and I think also um, the character means that people can immediately identify it as a game. I found even cultural heritage professionals were reluctant to contribute to a plain interface because they felt like they didn't really have the expertise, they weren't in charge of astronomy collections um, to enter content. So games are a really good way of lowering barriers. I don't think games are the answer to everything, but I think identifying the barriers to participation and then working out how you can get around them is key to any project. Um, so I was wondering how many versions of almost identical telescopes people could bear to see. It turns out about five before they want to strangle me. Um, but the game was random enough that they didn't have to see them that often. And I was surprised at how much people found to say about a brown stick that you can look through. Um, so these are some of the findings for my master's project. But what's interesting for today, I think, is that the interviews made me realise there's something about the act of looking at even a really boring brown stick. Um, looking at it long enough to find words to describe it gets people interested in the object. Um, the final trigger, sort of back in 2010, I think, was I spotted two art historian friends who really love Rococo, they love Boucher. Um, they'd been playing the game. And then and all the time I'd worked at the Science Museum, I'd never convinced them to come anywhere near the astronomy galleries. Um, but on Facebook, they were discussing heliocentric astrolabes because they'd come across them in the game. And I was like, there's something about this act of looking that is engaging them in a way that just walking through a gallery wouldn't. Um, and when putting today's talk together, I realised I've been thinking about that one way or another ever since. What is it about the act of looking that creates a sense of engagement? Um, slightly following on from that, my doctoral research is looking at how historians use, evaluate and contribute to collaboratively created digital resources. Um, it's a form of scholarly crowdsourcing. I'm comparing the attitudes and behaviours of academic and amateur historians. Um, which taught me very early on that it's a very um, morphous boundary. Amateurs often have the same high professional standards as academic historians. Um, and many amateur historians are trained as um, historians academically and just don't work in the field, and vice versa. A lot of academic historians now didn't train as historians back then. But I think amateur historians, whether working as family or local historians or whatever, they're a perfect example of the motivation that underlies a lot of volunteering in GLAMS and in these crowdsourcing projects. It's the motivation to exercise knowledge, skills and abilities that might otherwise go unpracticed. It's a chance to exercise mastery and to keep using skills that, you've, that you value. And I think also that you find enjoyable. Um, so it's all very well to talk about engagement, but I'd like to define it briefly. A lot of the literature just talks about engagement as being turning up, it's a presence at a physical venue. Um, and I'd like to think that we can do more than that, that it should be deeper than that. I'm always quite cynical about how much engagement is going on in these moments. Um, <coughs> but then I've noticed sometimes um, people showing other people their photos, like they'll be in a cafe nearby afterwards showing someone else their photos. So there is some kind of engagement going on. Um, Academia has a slightly different relationship to engagement. Um, it sort of relates to measures around impact, outcomes. Um, but I think what's key in this is that interaction and listening. So ideally it's a relationship that changes academia as well as it changes the people who are participating in the relationship. And looking at a museum definition, there's something about the act of paying attention. Um, <laughs> it almost doesn't seem to matter what excuse you find for getting people to pay attention. It's the framework that you create. And I think there are some more useful definitions of engagement that look at levels of engagement and how you can deepen engagement. Um, the department of the DCMS in the UK came up with this report, um, which is bizarrely useful. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I shouldn't say that in public. I didn't say that. Um, so they've defined four levels of engagement, each of which builds on the other. Attending is the process of paying conscious, intentional attention to content. Participating is an interaction that contributes to the creation of content. Deciding is making decisions about the delivery of resources for content creation. 
and producing is creating content which has a public economic impact. You can see they've got a certain angle here. They're going back to a business model um, or ways of deciding about what's important and what's not. But the act of deciding, choosing the fate of things, I think is a really deep level of engagement. <coughs> and of course, citizen science has a lot to contribute in this area. Um, well, I think what's important in this definition is the community. The community is actually where this, that the place where level three outcomes are produced. Um, so it's the community on forums and blogs and social media. Um, that's where the support is given. It's where experts pass on information to novices. Um, it's also places where um, cu curiosity is awakened as questions are asked. Um, and it's the support of the community when someone's curious. Um, and a really good example is this is Galaxy Zoo's um, Give Peas a Chance project, um, where they someone spotted a strange sort of green looking galaxy and said, what is this? Um, and the community didn't let the question die. It was slow, but well, comparatively slow, but um, ultimately they did came up through um, various levels of investigation. They got time on Hubble um, and they realised it actually found a new form of galaxy. And that was because the community provided a platform for that conversation. So I think while participation can change people, hopefully it also helps organisations change. Stuart mentioned Bonnie's model of um, contributory, collaborative and co-creative. And I think some of the best crowdsourcing projects, some we've heard about today, change as a result of their interactions with participants. They move from being purely contributory projects to collaborative projects where participants help shape the outcome of the project. Um, this is a, an aggregation of motivations um, from research into open source software, Wikipedia, volunteering in glam sectors in citizen science. I think what's exciting about these motivations is that heritage and humanities projects can meet many of them. But it's not only that, we can offer a service to the public by offering a platform where they can follow their interests and engage with our content. So what we're really doing is we're acknowledging that well-designed crowdsourcing projects can be immensely productive, but perhaps more importantly, they can provide a platform for learning, for fun, for mastering new skills, for practicing old ones, for enjoyable, meaningful activity around our shared heritage. And while the language in this quote is slightly formal, I think it could have come from an archive or from a museum today. But it's actually taken from James Murray's 1879 appeal to the English speaking public, or English speaking and English reading public. Um, which was their second appeal. The first was an appeal to the community of philologists who were kind of already actively engaged in connecting, collecting words. In this appeal, they asked the public um, to help them with their list of words that needed evidence of their history and usage to complete the Oxford English Dictionary. I mean, while you're in Oxford, you might actually, if you come in on the Banbury Road, you'll pass his house, it's got a blue park on it. Um, and responses like the slip shown poured in from the public. But the first edition of the dictionary wasn't completed until many years later in 1928. And I think this shows two things. The first is that even then, a call for public assistance could be embedded in scholarly practice and in public engagement. The same intrinsic motivations of leisure, social networks and community, learning and interest in the subject and a chance to practice skills are important. And it's still going on today. You can still participate in um, OED appeals, if anyone knows when bromance was first used, they're looking for help. Um, but it also shows that crowdsourcing as we know it has been transformed by technology, but not actually created by it. The ability of digital technology to provide almost instant data gathering and feedback, automatic validation to support the kinds of quality assurance processes that Kimberly talked about. The ability to reach both broad and niche groups through loose networks. These have all been particularly important. For collecting institutions, technologies also help manage the sheer physical issues of providing access to collections without worrying about space issues, um, conservation constraints, and even things like opening hours. So perhaps in the end, a better definition of crowdsourcing in heritage and humanities is productive public engagement with the mission and work of memory institutions. I think volunteering through GLAMS and through humanities projects um, provides a platform for lifelong learning. It's an opportunity to engage with cultural heritage, content and tasks 
by opening up access and inviting people in. So in conclusion, if we're creating participatory experiences to engage our audiences, why don't we make them part of the real work of the heritage and humanities by designing them around meaningful goals and working together with our audiences to create something bigger than ourselves? Um, I wanted to ask to what extent you think these meaningful goals uh, can be established at the beginning of a project. Do you, do you need to know what the goals are before mm. you start crowdsourcing or can they emerge on the way? I think it's a bit of both. I think institutional goals, are obviously, you know, if you're going and asking for funding, you should have a good reason for doing that. Um, but I think this kind of iterative approach that we heard about from Kimberley where there's different phases and you have a chance to learn and PCF has been through changes as well. Mm. Um, having the ability to change things in response. Um, and I think the way that the Zooniverse projects use forums is a really good example because people can start their own projects there. So mm -hmm. it's a combination of emergent and preset goals. Yeah, so you just have to have a listening ear to the ground. Yeah, and I, even in terms of how you fund, I know museums are terrible at setting up projects that end, the funding ends on the launch day and there's no way to change things afterwards. So you design funding structures that let you do that. Yeah, I thought your final thought about the, the idea of, of Glamour <coughs> becoming a, um, a centre for crowdsourcing and actually seeing that, maybe I'm extending what you're saying, but actually seeing that as part of their role of being able to gather information together is just a really powerful one. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Uh, I actually wanted to ask you about the uh, idea that do you think that this will happen in the I think one of the things that institutions offer that the Commons doesn't, um, in my experience, is something exciting about privileged access. So people like behind the scenes tours, they like behind the scenes blogs, um, they like that sense of communing with people who've actually got direct access to the material. Um, and there's a kind of charisma of the content of objects and documents that transmits itself in some way through those relationships. So I think a relationship with the collecting institution has a special something. Um, but one of the challenges for GLAMS is like, what is your role when anyone can do, anyone can create games about science, anyone can create games about dinosaurs. Um, when, when there's so much going on, you know, you really need to think about what you can bring to the offer. And I think as institutions with huge amounts of internal expertise, um, and a lot of tacit knowledge about how things were collected, they should be in some way looking to do that space. And I think the Commons doesn't have the same level of emotional engagement, and I'm not sure why that is, but that's just my sense of how they work. Any more comments, questions from the floor? Okay. Um, in that case, I'm going to thank you again very, very much, and you'll be Ask me about gamification. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, and I'm